Um, so once again, thank you all for, for joining today. Um, if you can't hear me, you can send me a private chat or if there's anything wrong with the audio, you can send me a private chat, but we've had some pretty good luck with, uh, with Zoom so far. Um, I'm gonna let you all know that I am gonna record this session and there is a high likelihood that it will end up um, on, uh, there's a high likelihood that this will end up on the, the Douglas um, YouTube channel. So if you wanna kill your camera, um so as you're not seen or whatever then you're more than welcome to do so um if you could <laughs> again mute yourself when kind of mute sylvia sorry sylvia uh when you when you jump in that'd be really really great and very helpful um just so we don't have any background noise competing uh if you have a question you can feel free to send me a private chat on the right hand side and i can uh pose the question to vlad myself um and um if you have any concerns about privacy in terms of the recording, you can let me know as well. Um, we're trying to edit this such that uh, no one's names or faces show up on the channel and all we hear is, uh, uh, in, in the video and all we hear is Vlad's melodious voice. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's how it's gonna work. Uh, there's also a raise hand function. So if you wanna raise your hand uh, and, uh, and I can call on you, we can try to do this as we've done it uh, in the past. Um, I did it last week, I guess, with where I can call on people as questions come up. Vlad has asked that we try to keep questions to the end because he's got some newer data towards the end um, that he'd love some feedback on. So uh, if we could try to respect that, that'd be really great. But that said, I think if there's any need um, uh, for clarity, um, you know, during the talk, just to enhance the, the understanding of what's going on, um, I'm sure Vlad would be happy to answer that kind of as we go, um, but maybe not kind of the more semantic or, or academic questions. So first of all, I'd like to thank Vlad. Vlad, Vlad was supposed to be in Montreal now. Uh, he is not in Montreal, he's in Halifax. Um, and he's, he's agreed to um, do the talk uh, remotely. Um, Vlad will be uh, hopefully joining my group um, as a postdoc sometime soon. He's a senior PhD student right now uh, at Dalhousie, working under the supervision of uh, Rudolf Boer. Uh, he's working on a really unique study looking at um, and examining basically offspring of uh, individuals who have major, major psychiatric illness, uh, which I'm sure he'll be talking to us uh, a fair bit about uh, and giving us the details of that study um, as the talk goes on. So I won't, I won't spoil the plot for you. But I just wanted to thank Vlad, uh, you know, uh, for for taking the time to do this, um, given all that's going on, and and you know allowing us to keep some sense of normalcy as uh, as all this all, all this stuff is going on around us. So thanks a lot, Vlad. Um, very happy to have you here, giving providing this talk today, and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for that introduction, Malar, and I I do want to say that I appreciate you hosting this as well. It's uh, quite a nice improvisation in terms yeah. of. Keep well, a sense of normalcy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but let's just get right into the talk. So I'm going to be talking about a few different uh, studies that all kind of relate to brain correlates of vulnerability to severe mental illness. So there's a little outline for the presentation today. I'm going to cover vulnerability to mental illness from a family history perspective of mental illness, specifically uh, the risk of bipolar disorder. Then I'm going to look at how early psychotic symptoms uh, relate to differences in cortical folding. Finally, I'm going to ground some of this discussion in uh, looking at the actual underlying reliability of some of this MRI data from the developmental cohort. And in the end, we'll discuss what I'm kind of currently spending most time on, which is trying to model the neuroanatomical maturity in our cohort. So in this first study, uh, while beginning to collect my own data, I collaborated with Tomasz Hayek and the Mood Disorders Clinic in Halifax and investigated the structural changes in the inferior frontal gyrus of individuals at familial risk for bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder characterized by manic and depressive episodes. A person with bipolar might show an abnormally elevated mood, often coupled with increased energy and goal-directed activity. Uh, bipolar disorder typically shows up in the late teens and early 20s and follows a recurrent course. And one thing we know about the disorders that it runs in families 
So first degree uh, family members have a tenfold increase of the disorder over the general population. And this makes us wonder if there's perhaps a shared uh, brain uh, change or abnormality in individuals that are at familial risk for the disorder, uh, along with individuals that are already affected. So one strategy to isolating biological risk factors inherent to bipolar is to use a family high-risk design in which uh, you recruit individuals early on as they pass through the age with the highest risk of developmental or of developing the disorder, uh, but before substantial illness burden. So you not only scan patients with bipolar disorder, but also individuals who are not affected, but who have a family history of the disorder. So therefore, brain changes detected in both groups, uh, bipolar patients and unaffected relatives might be less confounded by kind of typical things such as illness burden, other comorbidities, uh, the effects of treatment and medication, all of which have their own unique effects on the brain. So the group I work with has actually employed this uh, design previously and found increased inferior frontal gyrus volumes in both the patients and the unaffected relatives when compared to controls. And the involvement of the prefrontal gyrus was seen in Halifax, as well as in the sample in Prague, and has since been noted by other studies as well. And the inferior frontal gyrus, or IFG, is known to be involved in response inhibition, uh, which is affected in many symptoms of mania, from impulsive behavior and talkativeness to increased risk-taking. And in fact, the recent meta-analysis showed that response inhibition is one of the top neuropsychological deficits tied to bipolar disorder. But one thing, however, is the fact that the inferior frontal gyrus is actually quite a large structure and can be further subdivided into the pars opicularis, pars triangularis, and pars orbitalis. Furthermore, uh, we know that cortical volume is a composite measure uh, which is actually a product of cortical surface area and cortical thickness. Uh, this, this is something that earlier voxel-based methods were unable to disentangle, uh, but disentangling this might be important as surface area and cortical thickness are not genetically correlated and sometimes even affected in opposite directions. So in this replication and extension study, I wanted to accomplish a few things. I wanted to replicate the finding of increased uh, gray matter volume in the IFG. I wanted to find out which anatomical subdivisions uh, show this volumetric difference, and finally investigate if cortical thickness and or cortical surface area is driving this difference. So we recruited offspring from families that have at least one parent with bipolar disorder and who had participated in previous uh, genetic and imaging studies here in Halifax. The inclusion criteria was age 15 to 30 years old, representing the typical age of onset for bipolar disorder. This is also the oldest, oldest sample I'm gonna talk about uh, throughout this entire presentation today. So overall, we included scans from 103 participants. And the participants that came from parents with bipolar disorder were divided in two groups. So first, you have the unaffected uh, high-risk group, as the name implies. These individuals do not have bipolar disorder, no, nor any other access to psychiatric illness. However, they are at familial risk for bipolar disorder due to their family history and we had 32 of those. Second, we have the affected familial group. This group comes from parents with bipolar disorder and they have themselves also um, become affected with bipolar disorder, so there's 29 there. And finally, the third group where we recruited 42 healthy controls, free of personal or family history of psychiatric disorders. The MRI acquisition was done here at a local hospital with their 1.5T scanner, and we collected T1 structural weighted brain images for this. All the images were analyzed with FreeSurfer, automatically subdividing the cortex into gyral-based regions of interest, and this gave us measurements of cortical volume, surface area, and thickness for the inferior frontal gyrus. Statistical analysis was all done in R. Uh, first, I used multiple analysis of variants to investigate overall group differences in the bilateral IFG volume while controlling for things like age, sex, and intracranial volume. Then I used post hoc ANOVAs to see which subdivisions of the inferior frontal gyrus were actually driving the overall volumetric differences. And finally, in the subregions that showed volume differences between groups, I followed up to see if cortical thickness and or surface area were driving the actual difference. Uh, so despite the focused approach, uh, the analysis were still corrected for multiple testing. And here I report some correct p-values along with effect sizes, which are reported as partial error squared with its bootstrapped confidence interval. So jumping onto the results, uh, Replicating prior work, 
we found that the two groups with family history of bipolar disorder had larger right inferior frontal gyrus volumes. And the volumetric differences were localized to the parse uh, triangularis seen in the blue here and not the other two structures. And as you can see on the plot here, we have uh, uh, the mean volumes and we have uh, controls here and then the affected and unaffected groups uh, with higher volume. So next, uh, I investigated to see if the volume differences were driven by surface area or cortical thickness. And uh, the follow-up test showed that significant group differences were uh, located in the partial triangular surface area and not cortical thickness. And once again, the plot resembles the volume differences uh, uh, quite clearly. So once again, we have controls and the affected and unaffected relatives of BD, both with elevated surface area. And this makes even more sense when you zoom in on a correlation matrix uh, of the different structural measures of the triangularis. Uh, one relationship that immediately stands out is the high correlation between uh, volume and surface area in red at almost 0.9. Then we see a much lower correlation between thickness and volume in the lighter red. And just as what our previous literature uh, has informed us, cortical surface area and cortical thickness are not very well correlated in this region. In fact, they're actually negatively correlated, uh, highlighted in this light blue. So interpreting the finding a bit, um, Regional increases have been attributable to a variety of things from effects of medication to disrupted maturation. We know that normative brain maturation during childhood and young adulthood involves gray matter reductions across the cortex, leading to, leading some at least to suggest that this finding might reflect disruptions in brain maturation. However, we did control for age and this is really something that prospective longitudinal studies would be more suitable in commenting on. The localization of the parse triangularis makes sense as well uh, compared to some of the other subdivision as, as it's the most centrally involved in a response inhibition, something that we discussed as being altered in bipolar disorder. And as for the parse triangularis surface area specifically, there have been a few studies that examine heritability region by region and shown that the parse triangularis surface area is more heritable than its cortical thickness. And prior work has also shown that some genes influencing bipolar disorder are associated with cortical surface area. So in summary, uh, the study replicated the, find it, replicated the finding of increased inferior, inferior frontal gyrus of volumes in bipolar disorder. Uh, the volumetric difference was revealed to be localized in the parse triangularis, and the volume difference was driven primarily by differences in cortical surface area. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna look at actually some FORBO data, uh, looking at some early psychotic symptoms in youth. And before I begin, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint now has this image recognition feature built in that automatically suggests captions for pictures you paste in. And for this one here, it suggested coral reef. So I can assure you that we're not gonna learn much about the ocean today, uh, but I will talk a little bit about uh, psychotic symptoms and cortical folding and risk at, uh, in youth at risk for mental illness. So psychosis is marked by hallucinations, delusions, and disturbances of affect and behavior. And multiple lines of evidence suggest that it might be neurodevelopmental in origin, the idea being that genetic environmental risk factors negatively affect early brain development. And one process necessary for healthy brain development is cortical folding, uh, which may be abnormal in the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. And the process of cortical folding or gyrification uh, is what results in the gyri and cell side that give the cortex its kind of unique wrinkly appearance. It's also a uniquely mammalian solution to increasing cortical gray matter volume without exaggerating head size. So for example, if we didn't have cortical folding, our heads would have to be actually three times larger to accommodate the, the amount of surface area we have. And degree of cortical folding can be quantified with the local gyrification index, which I'll talk about in a sec. But importantly, cortical folding provides a window into some early development and major cortical folding patterns are determined largely before birth and finish undergoing the most rapid, rapid uh, developmental changes by childhood. So this sensitive period of neurodevelopment also overlaps with the timing of a number of environmental risk factors associated with psychosis. Cortical folding also actually optimizes the axonal wiring in the brain as the folds bring areas uh, closer together, requiring shorter axons and allowing quicker communication between brain regions. And the mechanisms of cortical folding are actually still under active investigation despite how basic of a, of, of a 
process uh, it seems to be. Uh, recent perspectives suggest that a few mechanisms are involved, including uh, forces that are created by the rapid expansion of the outer zone, which will become the cortex, and the slower growth of the inner zone, which is the white matter. And cellular, pro cellular processes are also key in this, uh, where increased number of basal progenitor cells leads to this tangential uh, expansion of neuronal layers. But more specifically, in relation to psychotic disorders, uh, there's been a number of large multi-site neuroimaging studies that found reductions in cortical folding among adults with psychotic disorders and those at genetic risk of schizophrenia. And there's some evidence corroborated by postmortem data uh, that the reductions are also frequently localized in the prefrontal cortex. So abnormal cortical folding uh, is also predicted for treatment response in first episode psychosis. And deficits with cortical folding have also been associated with more severe forms of illness. So taken together, the body of literature suggests that cortical folding alterations happen across the psychosis spectrum, which leads us to ask the question, are these cortical folding deficits present before illness onset? So in the current study, I examined the local gyrification index in teenagers at risk for severe mental illness many of which have experienced psychotic symptoms but did not meet criteria for psychotic illness. I hypothesized that psychotic symptoms would be related to lower cortical folding in symptomatic youth, particularly in the prefrontal cortex. And the participants in this work are part of the FORBO study that Millar was mentioning at the beginning, led by Rudolf Uher. FORBO stands for Families Overcoming Risk and Building Opportunities for Well-Being. So other than being perfect candidate for an abbreviation, a FORBO is also a large longitudinal study that's enriched for offspring of parents with a mental illness. Uh, the FORBO study itself began in 2013, has done over 2,000 assessments collected from over 500 individuals. And I've kind of come along and we've started doing brain scans uh, around the summer of 2016. So for this study, we collected MRI scans from 110, 110 FORBO participants with a mean age of around 14. Uh, exclusion criteria were any personal history of psychotic illness, serious medical neurological disorder, substance use, contraindications, the typical kind of stuff. Psychopathology was assessed with the uh, kitty SADS, and IQ was assessed with the uh, Weschler scale of intelligence. As for psychotic symptoms, we actually assessed them with multiple uh, instruments. So, uh, as part of the case as interview, but also using the funny feelings uh, questionnaire, including symptoms rated as definite psychotic symptoms rated by two independent raters. And finally, we also used the schizophrenia proneness instrument, child and youth version. For image acquisition, uh, we used the 3 TGE scanner uh, equipped at another local hospital here. And we collected T1 and T2 weighted structural images at one millimeter isotropic resolution. And just a quick word, we incorporated the T2-weighted structural images in, prop, in the processing because uh, we found that the T2 contrast helps the pipeline remove things like dura matter and blood vessels, uh, which can look quite similar on the T1. Plus, we use it for some other purposes as well. So I didn't want to reinvent the wheel when it comes to some of the processing. Uh, for the most part, we've adopted the human connectome pre-processing pipeline for our data uh, with the link just below. And there's a heavy reliance uh, on FreeSurfer as the kind of backbone of this processing, followed by LGI processing on top of that. So just a quick word about the local gyrification index. Um, it's kind of defined as a ratio of the total neocortical surface area, including the cortex that's kind of buried in the salsi, as you can kind of see here in red, and then divided by the exposed surface area that tightly wraps the brain but does not enter the cell side. So this can be done with brain slices by hand. And in fact, that this used to be done, but now it can be done more accurately and in three dimensions. And in general, humans rank among the primates with the GI of around three, as I, I mentioned before. Uh, but we're also not that special because other animals, uh, such as our friends, the dolphins, have a GI of around five. So for statistical analysis, I used mixed effect linear models, uh, the dependent variable being the average and atlas-based regional gyrification. The independent variable was the presence or absence of psychotic symptoms. 
And I also covariate co for things like sex and age and for the non-independence of the brain data uh, from related individuals. Uh, th this is where I included family ID as a random effect. And multiple testing was adjusted for with a false discovery rate. We also did some sensitivity analysis, uh, further covariating for things like lifetime cannabis use, stimulant, 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 stimulant use, sorry about that, uh, full scale IQ, and uh, total intracranial volume. So looking at the demographics here, out of 110 youth scanned, 48 met the criteria for a definite psychotic symptom on one or more assessments. Uh, general cognitive ability did not differ between participants with or without psychotic symptoms. However, youth with psychotic symptoms showed smaller intracranial volumes. And here we can take a look at the results. We have uh, the different brain regions on the y-axis, uh, the gyrification index on the x-axis, and then we have uh, individuals with psychotic symptoms in the darker blue and their counterparts without symptoms in lighter blue. And as you can see, the general pattern is that across every region, we see less folding in those individuals with uh, symptoms. And here's a, another graph that shows much the same thing. It's just that the, these are the regions that are more highly folded. And overall, the pattern holds where uh, individuals with psychotic symptoms show less cortical folding. So now let's turn to regions that remain significant after we actually corrected for multiple testing in the covariates. And here we see, in line with our hypothesis, uh, that the exploratory analysis revealed a lower prefrontal cortical folding in youth with psychotic symptoms, specifically in the medial orbitofrontal cortex and the lateral orbitofrontal cortex. Furthermore, the analysis revealed three additional brain regions that survived brain-wide correction for multiple testing all in the occipital lobe. So we have the cuneus, the pericalcarine, as well as the lingual gyrus over here. And as, as we can see, the few violin plots uh, is plotting the difference here. If you kind of turn your head, it's, you, can, you can see the histogram distribu distributions as well. So uh, overall, we found a pattern of lower cortical folding in adolescents who had psychotic symptoms, but who did not meet for criteria for a psychotic disorder. And directionality of findings uh, mirrors the literature in adult patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorders in which uh, the patients always exhibited less folding than the controls. The localization to the orbitofrontal cortex in our study was consistent with some prospective studies in patients at clinical high risk and also in animal models. So for example, patients at clinical high risk who convert to psychosis show steeper rates of cortical thickness decline and gray matter reduction in the orbitofrontal cortex than non-converters. Furthermore, uh, orbitofrontal cortex neurons have been shown to be common targets for antipsychotic drugs in animal models. And characteristics of schizophrenia also include cognitive deficits. Uh, the orbitofrontal cortex is involved in a number of disorder-related functions. And actually, interestingly, interestingly <laughs> previously, uh, Lynn McKenzie in our group actually looked at the cognitive data and showed uh, deficits in executive function in the same sample of youth with psychotic symptoms. Okay, so uh, now just going on to the occipital cortex folding finding. Uh, prior work has found reduced cortical folding in the lingual cortex in patients with psychosis. Um, if we actually switch modal modalities and look at fMRI work, uh, there's been found disrupted functional connectivity in these visual areas, um, and that has been shown to be a predictor of symptom persistence and burden. And finally, uh, 22Q11 deletion syndrome and, and other genetic risk for schizophrenia have been associated with cortical thinning of these regions as well. So to quickly summarize, the st study showed that psychotic symptoms in youth are associated with cortical folding deficits even before the onset of psychotic illness. Okay, so we talked a little, just a bit about family history and early symptoms in the context of mental illness. Now I wanna turn to more recent work uh, in which I examined the actual reliability of um, multiple MRI measures in youth at risk for mental illness. And once again, you know, this is grounded in the idea that population studies show that the majority of psychiatric disorders begin early in life, prior to age 24. Therefore, Forbo and other studies like ours try to find early markers of risk, uh, in my case, brain markers or biomarkers, 
However, identifying biomarkers actually hinges on the reliability of the underlying MRI data. And reliability is the ability of a measurement to provide consistent results under similar circumstances. Image artifacts such as ghosting, susceptibility, and most frequently head motion pose a great challenge to reliability. And it has been shown that head motion and healthy volunteers can actually be misinterpreted as gray matter atrophy in the process scans. Furthermore, there's worry that motion might be exacerbated in clinical population, populations and especially in younger individuals. Despite all this, uh, the reliability of developmental MRI has been underexplored. So, and what started as kind of an internal check and turned into a paper, I wanted to examine the scan-rescan reliability of multiple MRI measures in our developmental sample. I wanted to compare the reliability of different MRI measures and also look across the whole brain and see if there's any particular regions that might be hard to image. So for this, we scanned 53 participants, mostly teenagers, uh, mean age of 14. Uh, they were scanned twice, several weeks apart. And almost half of these individuals had a prior diagnosis of an anxiety disorder and 22 were diagnosed with ADHD. So not the easiest sample to scan theoretically. Uh, we collected T1 and T2 weighted images. This is stuff I've showed you before in the previous study. Uh, in addition, we also collected diffusion weighted images with a sequence that was nicely optimized for a friendly local physicist for higher quality and shorter duration. As before, we processed the data with the HCP pipeline with the LGI processing on top. Uh, the scripts were modified for our scanner and to use the NIHPD pediatric atlas for registration. And you can find them on GitHub where I posted them. For gray matter, uh, we looked at the volume, surface area, thickness, and gyrification reliability uh, across the FreeSurfer Atlas. Raw images were inspected by independent raters. And we also used a really nice automated machine learning tool that judges the quality of process data. It's called Quality, and uh, it's available for use online. And based on the QC, we had to six scans. So the final results are reported on 50 individuals. For this, we also assessed white matter on top of this, uh, white matter volume, as well as uh, diffusion tensor imaging properties, or DTI. Uh, and this was done on Johns Hopkins Atlas, and we excluded any data with motion one and a half times the voxel size. So I used R to calculate the test-retest intraclass correlation. The intraclass correlation indexes both the correlation and the agreement between measurements, and it's commonly used to quantify reliability. We assessed reliability according to frequently used criteria, where, for example, an intraclass correlation under four is considered poor, uh, things above 0.7 are considered excellent. And in the spirit of open science, the data, the code, and the results are available online in a reproducible notebook. So you'd be able to kind of look at the tables broken down by specific regions uh, and also the code that used to generate the results. Speaking of which, uh, the results. So first we have uh, the reliability of cortical gray matter volume. And if you look at the ICC in the top right, it's quite excellent overall. The colors represent the criteria I just mentioned and the only areas dipping below excellent are things like the frontal and the temporal folds Cortical surface area was almost as good. Uh, there were just a few regions like the insula and some parts of the prefrontal cortex that were just considered good rather than excellent. Uh, I'm not gonna point out every structure. Uh, that's kind of what the in-depth tables are for. And also keep in mind that the figures represent the mean intraclass correlation and the tables have upper and lower confidence intervals. So depending on how conservative you wanna be with interpretation. Cortical thickness, uh, we, we see a bit of a dip in reliability. We see overall it's at 0.81, uh, at least compared to the other measures so far. And some of the regions begin crossing the lower bound of the confidence interval into the poor category. Wrapping up the gray matter measures, uh, we also have cortical folding with an overall excellent reliability, 0.85. And as you can see through this kind of homogenous figure. 
On the white matter volume side, we see near perfect ICC. Uh, so I decided not to bother with a figure, it would be monochromatic. Next, we, look at a number, we looked at a number of DTI components. Um, so for example, axial diffusivity uh, had the lowest ICC of, point of about 0.78, which is still respectable. And fractional anisotropy was the most reliably measured at about 0.88. So in discussing these results, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to find a developmental work examining all these measures. Uh, a good comparison, however, is a paper by iScan from 2015. They focused on healthy adults, but they reported the exact same measures. And the good news is that if you look at the table here, uh, our reliability estimates are actually very similar to theirs, despite the fact that they're coming from uh, a developmental sample where anxiety and ADHD are quite well represented. If we look at the relative reliability across measures, uh, cortical thickness had the least, was the least reliable. Uh, this might be because the average thickness of the cortical mantle is about two and a half millimeters, which is kind of close to the one millimeter spatial resolutions that a lot of scans uh, use. And this also means that cortical thickness measurements may be particularly sensitive to motion artifacts, even in high quality data. On the flip side, white matter volume was most reliably measured, uh, perhaps because uh, gray matter might be tougher to segment due to things like intracortical myelin, while white matter is more hom homogeneous. And when it comes to DTI measures, axial diffusivity was the least reliable and fractional anisotropy was the most reliable. And this mirror is actually kind of the relative interest for these measures in the research community, where more studies are investigating fractional anisotropy, often as an indirect measure of structural integrity. One takeaway is that there are a few regions with lower reliability, and they vary depending how conserv conservative you are with the cutoffs. And this can be for many reasons, uh, from proximity to air-filled cavities or to the eyes, or for just running long distances along the brain and being more susceptible to motion. So knowing this can be clearly useful. So for anyone doing a hypothesis-driven study, but also anyone who's using things like applied machine learning, and wondering if potentially the patterns of results they're picking up on um, might be picking up on some noise uh, from the less reliably measured regions. And a reviewer actually asked to compare uh, some of these measurements to reliability estimates from functional MRI. And in general, our structural MRI reliability estimates were higher than those reported in functional MRI literature. So for example, one meta-analysis examined a decade of test-retest reliability surrounding functional connectivity. And the authors concluded that most functional connections exhibit a poor ICC of about 2.29. Another recent meta-analysis uh, examined test-retest reliability of common task-based fMRI measures. And likewise, their work revealed poor to fair overall reliability at about 0.4 across 90 fMRI studies. And this is one of the figures. They also did it for the HCP data. So where you see the ICC of some of the structural measures followed by some of the functional task measures over here in the colored dots. However, at the same time, I, I would probably want to stress that it's worth noting contrasting reliability of structure and functional MRI is not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. Uh, the excellent structural re reliability re report in this manuscript is based on the consistent reconstruction of a priori anatomically defined regions. Functional data, as we know, deals not just with the spatial, but temporal domains and others, and also tries to map onto changing brain processes, such as uh, what's happening during a particular task. Nevertheless, the discrepancy between the two modalities is worth acknowledging, as it can have practical applications, such as sample size requirements for biomarker discovery. So for example, if you have a less reliable measure that forces you to seek larger effect sizes and larger sample sizes to be adequately powered. So this is not without limitations. Uh, our approach of using manual ratings as well as automated quality assessments can become resource intensive, especially for larger scale projects, such as the modern biobanks collecting uh, tens of thousands of scans. Our data also comes from just a single site and it's acquired on the same scanner at both time points. We know that large collaborative efforts are 
more often made possible by things like acquisitions and scanners from different manufacturers at sites that can potentially be continents apart. But however, these challenges are being overcome with some standardization of scanning parameters and statistical techniques that correct for site differences. Another limitation of our study is the kind of parcellation scheme uh, for assessing regional reliability of these cortical areas and white matter tracts. And this hits overall on a century-old debate on what is exactly a region. And there's other parcellation schemes than the one we used in this paper that might be more biologically grounded. Uh, for example, Matt Glasser's uh, 2016 atlas based on HCT data and things like that. However, however, given that it's impossible to exhaustively test each parcellation scheme, we decided to focus on those that were most likely to be commonly used in the field and which came pre-installed as default uh, with typical MRI software. Thus, they can be a starting point to a great number of neuroimaging researchers and a basis of comparison for those on the cutting edge who choose to use newer or custom parcellation schemes. So to conclude, developmental MRI data can be highly reliable, even in youth at risk for mental illness or those already affected by anxiety and ADHD. Uh, we were the first, I think, to show actually the excellent reliability of the local gerification index in a pediatric sample. And we also noted that not all measures are equally reliable. So uh, not all regions are reliably segmented. And to this end, we've opened up our data and analysis so researchers can also look at the relative reliability of uh, what they're particularly interested in. Okay, so now I'll talk about what I'm actually currently working on, which involves using statistical learning to model brain maturation. Uh, this is something that's often called brain age in the field. And brain age can be predicted for individuals based on neuroimaging data using machine learning approaches. Uh, usually this is done through training on scans from healthy individuals. And the predicted age for a new individual can differ from his or her chronological age. And this is often called the brain age gap or brain age delta. So for example, for this individual, it appears that they might have potentially advanced aging. And for this individual, they have a younger appearing brain than what their chronological age uh, suggests. So a higher positive gap, or also known as older looking brain, has been related to things like worse cognitive functioning, um, in dementia specifically, uh, brain age can sometimes be estimated to be a decade older than the actual chronological age, as you see here with the gray being the age match controls and the individuals with dementia over here in this orange. And in fact, in older individuals, increased brain age has been shown to be associated with actual mortality rates as well. There's also been a number of papers showing that brain age gap is increased in common psychiatric disorders. A recent paper from Tobias Kaufman echoes these findings in a sample of uh, 45,000 individuals. Uh, what we see is that brain age for healthy controls uh, for in this plot are in gray, and there, there's a various uh, amounts of brain disorders plotted. Uh, one that I'll highlight specifically is schizophrenia, where you see a quite, quite, a, quite a large gap as well. And previous work has also shown that brain age was higher than chronological age, not just at baseline, but also progressively increased during follow-up for schizophrenia. But uh, one application where brain age uh, as a concept might be particularly useful is during development. Because adolescence is characterized by major changes in the brain. We have things like cortical volume, area, and thickness showing steep declines. White matter volume and subcortical areas are increasing. Uh, there's a great deal of synaptic pruning and at the same time increased myelination. And during the sensitive period, abnormalities or exaggerations in brain maturation can potentially relate to psychopathology. And it will be quite useful to capture the patterns of these neuroanatomical measures and integrate them into brain maturation or brain age index. And then we can use it to potentially identify individuals that are deviating from a normative developmental trajectory. And there have been a number of studies making models for brain maturation from childhood to young adulthood. Katja Franke uh, has done a good job summarizing some of these uh, studies as well as making her own contributions to the field. Uh, in general, the models can predict age during development, the developmental period quite well with a high correlation with chronological age and mean absolute errors of under two years. And there have been a number of interesting findings such as, for example, 
uh, lower brain age found in adolescents who were born uh, preterm. And deviations from normative trajectories have also been associated with lower cognitive performance on a number of cognitive tasks. But there's also been a number of limitations in the field. Uh, for once, we only see a fraction of the studies applying this concept in developmental studies. And this is likely due to the fact that it's quite difficult ascertaining these populations. Uh, and the reported accuracy of predicting chronological age from healthy uh, brain scans might also be a little optimistic, as uh, many studies report accuracy estimates through cross-validation in the reference sample. Finally, it's not fully clear exactly how generalizable some of these models are, as most of them have been trained on valid and validated on a single cohort. So what I'm working on now is building a generalizable brain age model focused on development and trained on multiple cohorts. I want to examine if it performs uh, well on a truly independent sample, uh, which are the participants in the Forbo study that I described. And finally, as a proof of concept, uh, I'd like to investigate, if, for example, individuals with ADHD and your developmental disorder deviate from normative uh, brain age trajectories. So in order to train this model, I acquired scans from six uh, external data sets seen here. Uh, I only included controls uh, age 9 to 19. The plot shows the distribution of age ranges by data set and by sex. So we have individuals from Abide, uh, the Child Mind Institute, and the Healthy Brain Network, things like CORE, uh, NIH, a study of normal brain development. And just to emphasize uh, how uh, this is very much a work in progress, I included a few hundred individuals from Ping just last night. So overall, the mean age of the training set was 14, uh, plus or minus three years, and enc encompassed almost uh, 1,500 scans overall. And for the independent Forbo data set, we are now at about 333 total scans, and around 150 if you ignore the reliability and longitudinal scans and just kind of focus on the unique participants. And the mean age is also 14, give or take three years. So all the data was processed with FreeSurfer 6, and uh, the numbers I just mentioned earlier were all the scans that actually passed through the QC with the quality tool. When it comes to the modeling, uh, I split the data 80-20, where the 80% or almost 1,200 scans were used for model training and hyperparameter tuning, and 20% was held out for testing. I used about 325 brain features to predict age. These were based on the FreeSurfer Atlas and encompassed the usual suspects, such as uh, volume, thickness, surface area, and cortical folding. But I also included subcortical volumes and a few overall measures, such as you know, total intracranial volume. To validate the accuracy of the model, a proportion of the participants' images are left out of the model. I used 10 uh, fold cross validation, repeated five times. So 90% of the participants in the training set were used to predict the age values of the left out 10%. And then this was iterated uh, through all the participants multiple times. And then the best model, based on minimizing the mean absolute error in years, was picked and applied on the remaining 20% of the scans uh, that we held out at the beginning. And then finally, it was all applied in a totally independent data set, which is Forbo. So for this, I implemented three machine learning models, uh, the elastic net, uh, random forests, and extreme gradient boosting. This was all done in R as part of the Tidyverse, or Tiny Models, uh, rather, framework, which is essentially an updated version of Carrot for those that are familiar with that. And hyperparameter tuning was done through grid search. So when it comes to the cross-validation uh, training data, all models did extremely well. So we have a GLM net uh, predicting age with a mean absolute error of about just one year. Uh, we have random forest that did even better uh, with less than half a year of error. But as you can probably guess, uh, this is showing signs of overfitting. And extreme gradient boosting uh, did really well as well, being off just about a year on average. So I've seen several papers that kind of report these numbers and stop here. But uh, what about the performance on the held out data set of almost 300 scans uh, that the model never got to see? So we have a bit of a drop off in performance, but it's still quite respectable. Uh, we have JLMnet with a mean absolute error of 1.6 years, random forests with 1.5, and extreme gradient boosting with 1.4. 
And I believe this is potentially one of the more generalizable models out there now as the performance uh, is assessed on scans from six different uh, studies uh, with different recruitment strategies, multiple sites, and multiple different scanners. At the same time, not everything is rosy. Uh, we're starting to see some bias creeping in, especially if you look at these two uh, rightmost plots. So for example, let me just, what's happening here, for example, is the model is overestimating the age of young individuals and underestimating the age of older individuals. And likewise, this is something that's happening here. So let's uh, finally move on and see how these models perform in Forbo. Okay, so a few things of note. Uh, the GLM net suddenly has this kind of full on downward shift and under predicts age across the whole cohort. As a result, uh, accuracy suffers and the error is about 3.4 years on average. And there's a few ways to fix this. Um, if I run multiple, uh, if I run principal component analysis first, then I can get GLM net to get closer to where it needs to be. Still not as accurate as the other two models, however. Random forests uh, are less accurate than on a test set, being about two years off on average. But uh, the bias that I mentioned earlier is kind of predominantly visible now. And gradient boosting uh, does best with a mean absolute error of under two years on this totally independent sample. Uh, but again, the model does more poorly at the tail ends of the distribution. And there's a number of papers out now dealing and addressing this specific bias issue in the brain age literature, and I'm making my way through them. But the simplest yet roughest kind of solution is to simply co-vary for chronological age in any subsequent analysis. So speaking of the analysis, I have some results from a proof of concept kind of perspective. So what I found was that a negative brain age gap, aka a younger looking brain, was associated with ADHD uh, in our sample when using the most accurate grading boosting model. And this could be a nice and interesting result and it would be in line with uh, the work of people like Philip Shaw that showed delayed maturation in ADHD. However, at the same time, uh, this association uh, was not there when using the less accurate elastic net model. So the predicted and the chronological age did not differ significantly in ADHD when using GLM net. Uh, so why this kind of dual approach? Well, there's a saying I heard that the only way to be comfortable with your data is to not look at it. However, I looked at it. And what we see here is that even after we remove all the low quality scans, uh, scan quality is still associated with the brain age gap for gradient boosting at about 0.38 and to a much lesser extent with elastic nets at 0.1. So it seems like the better performing model may be in part picking up on scan quality for its performance advantage. So the takeaway from this line of work so far, and what it would have been if the biological uh, psychiatry conference wasn't canceled, is that parallel use of multiple machine learning models or methods may shine some light on the relationship between brain development, scan quality, and psychopathology. And of course, I have some future directions for this work in progress. Uh, first is to reduce this bias we saw. One suggestion is to train on a very evenly distributed age pool and others to measure the slope of the offset in the training data and then apply it in the independent data. Another goal is to do some feature engineering, find brain measures that correlate most highly with quality control or of low reliability, and then remove them uh, as predictors from the get-go. And if time permits, I'd also would like to explore some nonlinear models to capture the nonlinear effects of aging as well. And finally, I'd like to actually apply this something clinically relevant, for example, uh, to examine to see if the deviation from normal trajectories actually relates to a dimensional measure of psychopathology and perhaps even the onset of mental illness. Okay, so thank you everyone so much, uh, individuals who are making the study possible as well to all of you for listening. I'll be happy to take any comments and questions. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, it was a great talk. Someone's muted, so you're not hearing the applause that- Yes, yes, just, one of the things we lose through this. Yeah, they like to just clap into themselves. Uh, but uh, we had a clap clap from Colin in the, uh, in the notes here, thanks Colin. Um, we'll, we'll, unmute, we'll unmute everyone and, and uh, give you a nice round of applause at the end. Um, so uh, I have to take questions from the audience. If you wanna you know, either chat them to me directly um, or uh, 
you like. Um, you know, you can put up your hand on, uh, on um, uh, raise a hand on, on, on the platform and I'll, I'll call upon you in order so that uh, we don't get our, our, our streams tangled, so to speak. Um, so I don't see any hands up or questions yet, but I have, I have a couple. Mm -hmm. ah, Lonnie, Lonnie has a question, I'm just gonna mute her. Um, hey, thanks, that was really great. Um, I was curious about the test retest study. Can you remind me first how long there was between the two uh, scans? Yeah, for sure. So it's an average was just about two to three weeks. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I thought it was months and I was wondering if some of what you saw was also just due to development during that time period. Yeah, for sure. And that's an important consideration because, you know, it's, the brain is rapidly changing at this point. So we decided to stick with a shorter time frame. I was also thinking about that. study. This is really more of a rumination than it's a question, I guess. Um, but um, you did some pretty rigorous, like, quality control for promotion and everything, correct? Mm -hmm. I wonder if it would be interesting to see, like, if you included the bad scans, too, um, how that would also impact um, your results and what you see. I mean, obviously you'd think that they would just go down, but to show. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea to see kind of like a, a, a subsequent uh, step of stringent yeah. quality control and how that might actually affect the results. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Um, so I think this is a related question. Colin had a question of how many scans filled QC for the machine learning part? Oh, so for the machine learning part, um, this is actually, uh, probably thousands. <laughs> okay. um, so this varies. Is this on manual QC or? No, uh, this is not manual. So this is why I'm very happy to be using the, the quality tool because uh, going through all these scans manually is not something I, uh, I can do at this point. But um, they vary. So they, they vary by site as well. So some particular sites, for example, I was just looking at the child mind data and uh, in their Staten Island part. I think 38% of the data failed QC, but some other parts did better about like 10 to 14%. So, but overall across all these samples, uh, if you get rid of some of the missing data and some of the data uh, that fails QC, you, you lose quite a lot of participants. Okay. Uh, Sylvia, you have a question if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. So, uh, I mean, great talk. It was super nice. I will steal some of the ideas for my future work. So, um, it's more a comment, actually. So, based on, sorry, there's so much noise in my, we have the child, and then if Dan is doing something, so the, but the, so, you know, we did a similar model using resting state, and then we were really worried about this, this kind of, the, you know, the slope being tilted, as you're mm. seeing. And then we, we asked around, so we were, we were at the, this meeting in Montreal about machine learning and the take home was not to correct it because whatever we were doing, we're kind of increasing the bias. So, so I think, you know, I think that it's great that you try to correct it, but the, but, but really the take home from the field was mainly not to correct that bias. And then maybe just one thing also is, you know, if you, I think that the best way to do that would be really to find your final model, to train as much as you can, find your final model, check no of the thing that you want to check. And then when you're done and then you, you're, you will not touch it again, then you test whatever you want to test and then you go with the result. I think that, you know, if you, if you can do that and then write that up in your paper, it's gonna, it, I think it's really the way to do that actually. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful suggestion. And um, yeah, that's, I, I share similar thoughts about this in terms of uh, even if I go with the correction and ideally I'd want to minimize the need for that. But even if I do, this is something I'd want to estimate on the training data and then uh, never cross kind of reference the independent data set that I want to apply it to. And, uh, you know, maybe just one question, because I said there are also other questions, but, and I don't think that there's really an answer, but one thing that always fascinates me when I see these kind of data is that, you know, if we think about your first study, so you have individual with a family history, but then they don't have the clinical onset, but they do have these same brain differences, if we want to mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. And then in your second study, you have this, I mean, you know, you, you have very big group difference, but then at the same time, we have really these individual that would be within the range of the, you know, kind of, uh, again, so my point is like, we have individual that do have some clinical feature that have a brain that is very similar in terms of the feature that you're looking at normal individual and vice versa. So how, you know, are we just looking, I guess that we're only looking at part of the puzzle there, but so how do you explain that? That some 
individual can be within can have features very similar to the one with that expresses symptoms and they don't have it and then vice versa and it's a big question yeah no i mean but yeah for sure i mean it's a broader question that has to do with psychiatric imaging and diagnosis and everything i mean the, what are the effect sizes that can actually separate clinical groups uh, and things like that. And I have no illusions about some of my earlier studies about that there's, there's quite massive overlap. And I was pretty uh, upfront about showing that in the distributions as well. Um, which you can see it inspired me to start getting into moving beyond mean differences and more with potentially predicting at the level of the individual by using multiple sources of information yep, as in the later work with some of the statistical learning approaches. I completely agree, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sonia had a question and uh, she asked, um, did you train quality independently on each cohort uh, and which cohort did you train it on? So I myself did not train the quality model. It's, uh, it's based, uh, let's see, I'll pull out the slide later, but it's, uh, it, it was trained on a few samples. Uh, I forget all of them now, but I think one of them actually did include abide. So it was trained elsewhere uh, by a number of individuals who uh, did quite rigorous manual ratings and then trained the machine learning model to identify quality based on those. And I just use uh, their model. So uh, I kind of keep it consistent by just using their quality control tool. I don't train it myself. Okay. I have a related question actually, and I'm gonna get to Jamie's question just after that. Um, so for the last sample too, so, because of the multi-site nature of it, you know, I'm, I'm becoming more and more aware of being able to use combat as a way of dealing with inter-site variability. Have you looked into that technique at all? And do you have any thoughts on how that could help you normalize um, site-specific variants, if that is indeed driving some of the errors that you see in terms of training and prediction? Actually, I have not heard much about combat, so I can't actually comment on that, but I'd be curious we, to know more. We, we, can, we can talk offline, it's something that, uh, made a presentation about that. Uh, our last human in-person presentation uh, <laughs> talked a lot about that, um, but something I've been thinking about kind of before that too. So we can we can chat about that, but I'd, I'd uh, employ you to look on it, look at it. It's a nice uh, technique um, um, developed by Taki Shinohari at UPenn uh, and, and might be something that you can easily implement here that might improve that kind of, uh, same thing for Sylvia, that offset bias that you have there um, in terms of younger, individuals looking older and vice versa. It's definitely uh, something I'd like to look into. Thank you. It might, it might be very helpful there. Uh, Jamie, do you want to ask your own question or shall I? Um, Jamie's so shy. Um, All right, here I am. Okay, he's not that shy. It was just a really quick question. I wondered about the mental state of the bipolar patients in the first part of the study. So were they, were they manic, depressed, euthymic, or, or all of the above? Uh, I believe for the first study, they were all of the above. There was no, uh, I, I don't think they were particularly necessarily scanned during uh, euthymia or uh, manic phase or anything like that. Okay, great. Uh, any, do you have any follow up, Jamie, or is that good? No, it's just, uh, I'm curious because we're interested in studying bipolar in our lab and um, I've heard about difficulties, and especially in scanning, uh, you know, first of all, recruiting patients who are in the depressed state, and then scanning pa patients who are in the, in the, uh, in the manic state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I could comment more on that, but that's actually a study that I, I kind of was involved in early on, but then I kind of started focusing more on my own data. So I don't fully remember the recruitment strategies for that. Okay, thank you. Um, if no one else has a question. I'm not I do, I do. If no one else has, so it's Sylvia again. So very quick one. So the, I mean, the, you know, the medial uh, orbital frontal is my favorite region. I guess we all have a favorite brain. <laughs> that's mine. And then I was very sad to see, um, you know, and I think you Richard started the, the um, you know, kind of that, that was me one region that was a little bit more problematic for cortical thickness. It's, it's also one of the brain regions that pop up in most of the, in, in several disease, several studies, mm -hmm, several, mm -hmm. Do you think that the, you know, so like, what would you advise? I mean, just not using cortical thickness or what? No, I don't think I'd be as dogmatic to say that. I think the real takeaway is to just be aware of it, to kind of know the relative reliability of some of these structures and then make sure that uh, if you're focusing on a specific area that you're potentially adequate powered to do that. 
or if you've seen patterns of results that all cluster on areas that aren't exactly the most reliable that you kind of know ahead of time. So, you know, if, if you have a presentation where some of your top predictors, you know, frontal and temporal poll, uh, studies like this can tell, maybe let you know that, uh, hey, that might be driven by noise. Yeah, and that's likely to be more of an issue in the longitudinal setting, not necessarily cross-sectionally as well. So it's something to keep in mind Good there. point, good point, yeah. Um, I have, uh, I have one last question. Uh, well, I have a comment from Hire Nukia. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Awesome work, really like the QC project. Um, and my last question is, uh, I'm actually a bit surprised by the reliability in the test we test sample for the, in the younger folks. So uh, can you give us some tips and tricks on how you actually keep people, because that, that assumes that people are quite you know, stable in the scanner, aren't moving very much, whatever. So can you maybe talk a bit about what you guys do to prep participants? So kind of like the dark arts of our, of our research programs that no one really <laughs> talks about is, you know, what do you do with participants when they get there? Um, yeah, for sure. Provide some insight there. So we're not actually as sophisticated as some of the other studies out there that can do uh, fancy things like uh, tracking a pet motion in real time and so on and so forth. But we do have a great existing relationship with a lot of these participants, especially because they've already come in for the Forbo study, many of them multiple times. So they have uh, kind of, they're no longer as, uh, as scared to be at in a hospital setting and things like that. Plus we have really nice, a uh, really nice research uh, coordinator, Holly, who's super nice with the kids. And some of the, the techs are also quite uh, nice and understanding. Um, we make it so that the individuals are actually free to explore the MRI uh, scanner and not necessarily commit to the scanning if they don't want to, or if they're not feeling it, just to kind of get a sense of the place. I even actually made a, a little video that's helped a lot in terms of uh, showing the individual participants uh, filmed on location exactly what's going to happen when, what kind of noises are you going to hear. I even compared them to some dubstep music and things like that to appease some anxieties uh, and whatnot. And also um, during the scan session, we have a little extra headroom in terms of our uh, scan protocol uh, duration. So we, we can actually rescan uh, scans that uh, don't turn out that great as well. Fantastic. So I'm going to cut off here because we're already a bit over time. I'm going to mute everybody to so we can actually regale you in applause properly. So thank you very much um, for the talk. Thanks for doing this. Uh, um, much appreciated. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for participating and, and joining us through all this. And, uh,